Welcome to Science on Tap. I hear I have a voice that carries. All right, thanks for coming tonight. My name is Carol Warden. I'm the host tonight for Science on Tap. Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea, an idea conceived in 1905 that the boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. Our partners in Science on Tap include Monaco Public Library, Lakeland Badger Chapter of the UW Alumni Association, UW Kemp Natural Resources Station, UW Trout Lake Station, Oak Fire Pizza, and WXPR Public Radio. Science on Tap is supported uh, through a grant from the Brittingham Fund through University of Wisconsin-Madison. And there are three ways to watch. Come here and join us in person like you are. Uh, you can also watch on YouTube live, um, or you can check in at a later date where we archive our videos on scienceontapmanaqua.org. Our next event is either Wednesday, December 7th, or Thursday, December 8th, which we'll get to that in a moment. It'll be here at Oak Fire, and we will have Jennifer Price Tech of the Wisconsin DNR talking about her bear research. So, that said, I have a quick poll for the audience. Um, Oak Fire loves to host this event for us, but they are not able to serve dinner on Wednesday nights. So, with that, we are deliberating um, between two options. So we're wondering if our audience would prefer not necessarily having dinner on site, but having it on Wednesday night, or having the event on Thursday night with dinner on site available. So, show of hands, option A, Wednesday night without dinner, Thursday night with dinner, 50-50, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, well, we'll talk amongst our partners that do Science on Tap, and we will get back to you on what the future uh, dates will be for our Science on Tap event. Tonight, we have Dr. Nathan Chin to tell us about ways to reduce our risk for dementia. Dr. Chin is an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin Department of Medicine and the medical director and clinical core co-leader of Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Nathan was born and raised in Watertown, Wisconsin. He spent a good deal of time on his local CSA and grew up appreciating the importance of ecosystems and proper land management. His father was a family physician in their small town, and so he experienced the true pleasure of helping people through him. While his dad never pressured him, Nathan grew up believing he would become a physician. That passion persisted through college, and so did his desire for preserving the environment, which is why he, got, he also got a certificate in environmental studies. Nathan's mother was his father's caregiver when he was diagnosed with dementia, and so he has particular focus on caring for the caregivers of the family. His sister is a family physician in Seattle, and they remain close, and Nathan enjoys hiking, walking his dog, listening to podcasts and audiobooks, and now caring for his two sons, the youngest of which just turned two months old. <laughs> All right, so per tradition, here is our trivia story question about Nathan, or Nate, would you prefer? Okay. When Nate was a first-year medical student, he went to Peru with his parents, and they were traveling around at high altitudes, and the night before they were supposed to hike at Machu Picchu, he developed acute pulmonary edema, <clears throat> the altitude sickness. His father had a stethoscope with, with him, which was quite random, and they had to call an ambulance to take Nate four hours to a high-altitude center for tourists. So instead of going to Machu Picchu, he spent three days in a hyperbaric chamber. He was fine the whole time, but it was quite the experience, and while it's not our usual, typical, funny story here at Science on Tap, the whole experience was quite surreal, and now he's learned about how to manage his altitude sickness with medications from here on out. But there is a silver lining to this story. While he was recovering in the hospital, he ended up sharing his hospital room with someone special. Who was this person? A. <laughs> Why didn't I put that as one of the guesses? A. The Dalai Lama, who was in the area on a pilgrimage and ended up with an illness. 
B, his father, who developed food poisoning the same night Nathan got altitude sickness, or C, renowned soccer player Pele, who is suffering from dehydration. So, A, Dalai Lama, B, his father, C, Pele. Wow, it was his dad. <laughs> All right, Nathan Chin. Oh my gosh. That, that is a great trivia question. Um, thank you all for having me. I would say, though, to the person over here, my girlfriend who became my wife was on that trip, and she spent three days with my mother while I was in the hospital. And so she's the real person who may have suffered and or had a different experience than she anticipated. So. Well, I, I love coming to these types of events. I love talking about how we can keep our brains healthy. And I certainly am looking forward to the Q&A part of this. So I welcome all questions. There's not a single silly question out there. And so please feel free to ask anything. I'd start by saying one of the most common questions that I like to address is what is normal aging? And that is because we often will confuse normal aging with having a disease. And so sadly, our brains reach their peak performance at about the age of 30. So that's when we're at our best. Yeah. But that does... Now, hold on, hold on. So then... <laughs> so after the age of 30, there are subtle changes that happen. But most of the time, we don't notice those. And they're always unique to the individual, because based on what we do during the first 30 years, some parts of our brain are stronger than others. So for instance, people who speak multiple languages tend not to have language changes after the age of 30. People who are good at calculations and math tend to have that part of the brain preserved. Regardless, it's very subtle. Most people don't notice that. But roughly around the age of 60 or 65, we start to notice more age-related change. And so that, that could be whether it's a difficulty finding the right word in the middle of a conversation or finding the right fact feeling like we need more repetition to learn things, or just feeling like our thinking is overall a little bit slower than it has been when we were in our 20s and 30s. These are all normal. The problem, well, I'll give you an example of what's really normal, walking into a room and not knowing why you went in there. That is normal. And, and I, so if you, if you came to my memory clinic and that was your primary complaint, I would just send you away because that doesn't mean anything. You're probably not paying attention when you were walking into that room. And, and so, but the important thing is sometimes there are, there, there are diseases that occur in the brain and we need to be able to differentiate well, what is normal and what, what is abnormal. And so abnormal are conditions called mild cognitive impairment and dementia. So these are two very broad terms. Mild cognitive impairment is when you are noticing, I'm having symptoms a lot more often than I should. And these symptoms are starting to stress me and other people are noticing them as well. You then go and speak to a healthcare provider who does some form of screening of your, your thinking ability. So when I use the word cognition, cognition just means your, your memory, your language, your ability to pay attention, your visual spatial ability and how you understand distance. You, we test that. And it's a brief screen. But if that were to become abnormal, but you're still doing all the things you do every day, managing your finances, your medications, driving, well, then that's mild cognitive impairment. So it's having symptoms and having some lower scores on testing. Dementia, on the other hand, is the symptoms are usually more significant. Your testing is usually a little bit worse. And it's starting to impact your ability to do your regular daily activities. And there's no particular order in which it has to happen. Sometimes it's managing your finances or your medications. Sometimes it's keeping appointments. For some people, it is cooking and cleaning. It, we just know that you're no longer able to do those things because of your cognition. And I emphasize that point. If you are never a good chef and the food doesn't taste good, that's not a problem. That's your baseline. <laughs> so we always have to keep that in context. But that's what dementia means. In, in truth, there's a lot of stigma and a lot of misunderstanding about dementia, but it's really a collection of symptoms and things that a person experiences. Now, all of that is different than Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is one of many causes of thinking change that lead to mild cognitive impairment and dementia. There's actually multiple. The big ones that we think of are Alzheimer's disease, 
a condition called frontal temporal disease, which affects the front and the side of your brain, Parkinson's disease, a cousin of Parkinson's called Lewy body disease, and then vascular disease. And we certainly see more vascular than we've previously given credit to. Historically, people used to say you had to have a stroke, and then you develop thinking changes. And that's still true, but that's only one cause of vascular change. What we're seeing more and more now is people having high blood pressure for 30 years and having those changes, subtle, small changes in the brain, not strokes, but just subtle changes that are then leading to the thinking changes and eventually those difficulties with doing day-to-day -day functioning. So those are the five big ones that we think about. Alzheimer's is the most common, but what we're seeing now in research is that very rarely is Alzheimer's the only change that's happening in the brain. It's called multiple etiology dementia, meaning multiple things are happening in the brain. So usually it's going to be Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease, or Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body disease, or Alzheimer's, Lewy body, and vascular. And we can't know all of these things if we don't look for it. And so the field is, is finally waking up to the fact that as our brain gets older, lots of different things are happening to it. But I think what's really important is that lots of things are happening that are treatable. So if you have sleep apnea, and you don't know it yet, and you're not using a CPAP, that is a major contributing factor to thinking change that is entirely reversible. The earlier you can identify it, the better. Depression is the greatest mimicker of dementia. So having a low mood, feeling sad, can really impact your thinking ability and your ability to take certain tests, and then your ability or desire to do some of your day-to-day -day activities. Thyroid issues can do it. Medications can do it. Too much alcohol can do it. So there's lots of different things that we can identify that are actually reversible, which stresses the importance of when you're noticing a change, fighting that stigma, fighting that fear, and actually being evaluated. Because certainly there are things that we can do. If it is Alzheimer's disease, there's still things that we can do. And in a few minutes, I'll talk about what we're doing in research. But even in Alzheimer's disease, there's a lot of things that we can do to keep the brain healthy. Now, Alzheimer's disease, as we see it now, is the accumulation of two abnormal proteins in the brain. One protein is called amyloid. It develops first. The second protein is called tau. Tau is actually a protein in our brain cells. When that protein forms, it kills our brain cell, and then we can no longer communicate. So these are the two things, amyloid and tau. It took us decades to be able to identify these proteins in living people. So for the first 30 to 60 years, people had to pass away, and then pathologists had to look at the brains, find these proteins, and then compare them to notes from doctors rounding in the hospital or actually in the, in the ins, uh, insane asylums. And you can imagine the handwriting was really poor, and so their ability to compare these things is actually really limited. And so now, we're able to identify these proteins in living people, in people who don't even have symptoms. And so that's how the field has progressed. So we can now identify Alzheimer's disease in people who don't know they have it. So that's 20 to 30 years before they would ever develop symptoms. There's some ethics to this, because not everyone who has these proteins ends up developing symptoms. And we don't yet understand why that is. But that's a good thing because it speaks to the brain's ability to push back on disease, which is why we spend so much time talking about brain-healthy lifestyle decisions, brain-healthy habits, because there's this idea of a buffer. Some people develop amyloid and they never develop tau. Some people develop both of them but never develop symptoms. Some people develop the proteins, get diagnosed, but then gradually change over decades versus other people will change over years. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. And so we're trying to understand that variability. And so the ability to identify these changes is really critical. Also, the ability to do it via easy techniques. So for instance, for the past five to 10 years, if you wanted to, well, you may not want to know, if researchers wanted to know if you had these proteins, you'd have to drive down to Madison, Wisconsin, for a two-day visit, we would do a lumbar puncture. It's a small needle in the back where we collect the fluid. And we would do a, a fancy imaging scan called the PET scan. So we can identify the proteins that way. 
But within the past few years, we now can identify those proteins just with a blood, blood stick, which you could do anywhere. And so when we talk about the Wisconsin idea, it's really this. It's the ability to reach everyone in this great state, not just the people willing to come to Madison. Now, there's a lot of ethics to this. Do we really want to know if we have these changes, if it's not a guarantee that you're going to develop actual symptoms? How do you know if you're going to develop symptoms? What is the predictive value of these tests? And we don't have answers to those questions. That's what we're working on. But the idea when we talk about research participation is we need to access, we need to have people from all walks of life, all areas of Wisconsin, so that we know that these tests are actually valid in everyone and not just the people living within 60 miles of Madison. So that's where the field is going. But it's very exciting. Along with that, though, is that we do have effective clinical trial drugs that get into the brains of people who have the first protein of amyloid and can actually remove that protein. And that took decades as well. This is prior to me. There's been over 400 failed clinical trials, billions and billions of dollars spent with no success. And we anticipate at the end of November, at the big annual conference in San Francisco, that one study is going to show true effectiveness of a 27% reduced decline. That's a lot of fancy language, reduced decline. So a person is still changing, but they're changing slower because the drug removed amyloid from the brain. So that's a big first step. There was already a drug that was approved earlier this year, but many people didn't feel like the process was fair or transparent, and so no one uses that drug. So if any of you have heard of aducanumab, that was the drug that is very infrequently used, and it's not covered by insurance. This newer drug will likely get approved, we think, in 2023, and be helpful to people who have either mild cognitive impairment or dementia. And I will tell you, based on talking to my patients in clinic, if I can delay progression by two years, by three years, by five years, that is a huge difference to people. Huge. To the economy alone, that's a huge difference because it reduces cost. So that's where the field is moving. At our center in Madison, we're using the same drug in people who are healthy, who have amyloid, but no symptoms, with the idea of being prevention. And that's a national study, too. There's other drugs, too, that are looking at the same thing. But that is where the science is pointing. If Alzheimer's is these two proteins, and there's plenty of people who still say it's not those proteins, but right now, most people would agree, whatever the underlying causes of the proteins, those two things are very important. If we can actually remove them 10 years before a person would technically develop symptoms, we, in essence, have prevented the symptoms of dementia, the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And so that's why it's really important to understand the difference between just thinking ability and disease. Because if we can separate the two, we recognize we don't really care about the disease if it doesn't change who we are and what we experience day to day. So if we can remove that piece of it, even if we don't cure it, even if a person continues to develop these proteins, if we can put those to such a low level that they're not forgetful, that they're not repeating themselves, that they're still doing all the things they want to do, we can really promote brain health, this idea of a brain buffer or brain ability. That's what we all want. We all want to have our best abilities for the rest of our lives. And so our center is also working on that. What are the things that matter when it comes to keeping your brain healthy? Now, some of these things are addressing the vascular changes, but most of them are trying to just address the function of brain cells, keeping those cells working to the best of their ability. So if you imagine that each one of you in this room is a brain cell. Now, none of you are supposed to be touching okay, in this example. But if you wanted to communicate, this is sort of like um, that game where you, you whisper a message to each other and it, and it gets through the room. But imagine it's a ball, and you're tossing a ball to each other. That's how our brain works. One cell is communicating to the other via this ball. And when a brain cell gets sick, the ball falls and it no longer works. So in person with Alzheimer's disease, there's a lot of people that are sick, the ball never makes it around, and therefore we're forgetful. But there are plenty of things that we can do to make all of you healthy and strong, 
so that maybe you're injured from Alzheimer's, but you're still passing that ball along. That network is still very much flowing, and therefore you're not really even noticing that you're a little bit slower or that you might have misplaced something, because you're, you're actually functioning better. And so that's what I mean by brain health and brain buffers. So the science is very clear. And actually, you know what? Let me stop and just ask. Can someone shout out to me, what do you think is the, the number one thing you can do to keep your brain healthy? Exercise. And the answer is yes. Exercise is the most studied, and it shows the greatest benefit. But that's kind of a vague term, exercise. What does that mean to us? And so when we go down to the details of it, it's really about getting your heart rate up so that you're having an aerobic activity. Usually that's about 70 to 80% of your maximum heart rate. Maximum heart rate would be really pushing yourself to the point where you can't go any further. No one really should be exercising to their maximum heart rate, right? And so 70% of that, which is still a lot. So that's what the studies are looking at, 70%. We consider that moderately vigorous activity. So an example will be, we call it the talk test. If you're doing an activity, which I imagine a lot of you do up here in this beautiful part of Wisconsin, if you're doing the activity and you could sing to the person next to you who's doing it as well, that's considered light activity because you're able to sing to them. If you could talk to them but not sing to them, that's moderate. If you can't do either, that's vigorous. We, now, granted, vigorous is beneficial. So if you're, if you're able to do vigorous, wonderful. But you don't have to do it when it comes to brain health. The moderate level is just fine. The other benefit to this is it's all relative to your own body. So if walking at a good pace gets your heart rate up, you're actually doing it then. So you don't need to be sprinting. You don't need to be doing laps in the pool. Those are all great things. But it's all relative to your body and what you want to do. I would rather you pick a slightly less intense activity that you're going to do every day than something that you're going to do once a week and dread going to the gym to do. And so that's what we're seeing, is yes, there are facts, 150 minutes a week of an activity is, is what the CDC wants us to do, but to be able to do that is to change habits, and that's a really hard thing to do. And so finding these small steps is all we really need to start with. So if it's walking, great. People bike around here. Biking, great. Do it safely, please. But <laughs> these are things that are going to be helpful to your brain. So exercise is certainly one of them. Can someone shout out another one? Diet. diet. Right. Diet is, I, I actually don't like talking about diet because I think it's so hard. Um, diet is certainly beneficial. It's also highly debated. So you, will, you could find an article to back your diet somewhere. <laughs> it's, just, it's just how it is. And we constantly are in conflict. Mediterranean diet, wonderful diet. Oh, wait, no, it's not as great as we think. The diet that we talk about is called the MIND diet, which is Mediterranean, heart-healthy, low-salt, and highly antioxidant foods like berries. That one's been studied in Chicago. It does show to be beneficial. It's really meant to be vegetables, fruit, lean meat, olive oil instead of uh, margarine. But it's really it's tough to do, because if you want to talk about a habit change, this is a tough one for us. This is a culture. We enjoy our food. We enjoy getting together with people. Technically, alcohol is not really good for us. I know. I know. <laughs> it's dehydrating. It's not just that, but yes. Uh, but I, so we have to find, you know, we have to be balanced in this. And so for my, for my patients, I, I ask people not to drink more than one a day. But even then, they'll tell me, no, that's not going to happen. So moderation. But... The idea of being, if we can make small changes, that's still going to make a difference. And that's what the studies show. Even small, subtle changes towards a healthy diet is better than nothing. So for, for my practice, I actually am more concerned about what peop, avoiding certain foods than telling people to eat certain foods. So highly processed foods, no one benefits from that. And it's hard to know what is an ultra-processed food, but if it can last more than a year, that's ultra-processed. <laughs> You know, that's not natural, right? Margarine is not natural. And so that's, I prefer butter and I prefer olive oil. But so if it, if it can last a long time, that's not really natural. All the chips that we enjoy, soda, these things are not for our best interests. The full disclosure, I stopped at Culver's on the way up here and I had a Dr. Pepper. <laughs> that, I mean, that, that's just balance for me. But the more we can gravitate towards that, the better. I would tell you, as you heard, I have a two-month-old. 
And so to me, the most important healthy habit is sleep. Because when you don't have it, you know it. And you feel it. The other amazing thing about being a human being is we are able to adapt to deprivation in such an amazing way. You can sleep five hours a night, and you can do that for 30 years, and you will come into my clinic and tell me, I'm fine. I sleep five hours. I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people that thrives on five hours. Do you know what percent of human beings are actually genetically designed to thrive on less than six hours? One or less. So unless you think you're a part of that 1%, it's unlikely. It's just that you have learned to adapt, which is great. I mean, you, you were able to, to live your life with less sleep and function and do your work and, and enjoy your time, but it's not good for your brain. So the ultimate is seven to nine hours, which is hard. Seven, and it's all depending on your body, but seven to nine hours of restorative sleep. So it's not just being, <laughs> I'm hearing some groans. It's not just being in bed. Well, got my seven, I'm done. You actually want to be sleeping, and you want to have a good quality sleep. And deep sleep is really important. So there's stages of sleep. And deep sleep, which is called stage three, that is where we believe you actually clear out the proteins of the brain that are not supposed to be there. So when I talk to you about amyloid, we believe, based on the studies so far, that during that deep sleep, you are clearing out that protein. And so people later in life that develop Alzheimer's, is it possible that by not getting that stage three deep sleep enough through 30, 40 years, did that protein just stick around longer? That's a, that's a potential mechanism. It's hard to prove that, but certainly that's a pathway that could be a factor. So that's the key thing. The other thing is timing of sleep. You know, I have a lot of people who say, well, I'm... I'm a night owl. I go to bed at 1 a.m. and I wake up at 9 and I still get the number of hours you tell me. And that, you know, I, I can't fight that some people are just, they're just meant to, to go to bed late. Again, the percentages are not in your favor if you're one of those people. But what we're finding is that deep sleep happens earlier in the evening, between 9 and midnight. So if you're going to bed at 1, even if you are getting eight hours of sleep, you're less likely to reach that deep sleep. And that's a problem, because that's what we need. We need to get to that deep sleep. The other thing that we see is as we get older, we're going to the bathroom more often. Pain is keeping us up. We're having racing thoughts when we wake up. So all of these things you could work on. It's called sleep hygiene. These are things that can help us so that we can stay sleeping for longer. One of the most important things that we all could do is not watch television or our iPhones or our iPads one to two hours before bedtime. I know, again, more groaning. I didn't realize you guys would be so, so against me, but <laughs> this, that blue light that we take in from these, fake, these devices, it tricks our brain into thinking it's daylight. And so, of course, we don't want to go to bed. We've been stimulating our brain, not in a good way, but in a way that tells us it's daytime. And so the real, the real benefit would, again, be two hours before bed, maybe an hour before bed, no screens, you dim the lights, do something that's very soothing, and then you fall asleep. This is the same way you would try to get your kid to fall asleep is what we need to be doing for ourselves. And so that's a really important one. You guys are doing one of our other important ones, which is cognitive enrichment. This idea of any kind of learning is important to the brain, and that is true. So anytime you challenge your brain, you are telling a brain cell to do a different activity than it was doing before. So some people will try brushing their teeth with the other hand. That's sort of like that. But people who do crosswords or Sudoku, people who read just different things, coming to a lecture, these are things that are really good for your brain because you're challenging it in a new way. Now, people who are really good at a particular activity and do that activity, that's not brain training. That's not enrichment. You're just sort of fire. You don't even have to fire your brain cells to do that. For instance, when you brush your teeth, I bet your, your brain cells are just not even firing. It's so built in to the network. But when you do something different, then it's forcing it to, to learn, to adapt, and therefore strengthening your brain, which we think could be pushing back on changes, disease. Now, there's no particular activity that's going to be the activity. You hear people talk about learning a musical instrument or learning a new language, and certainly those are great things. Those are really challenging, 
and it might be overwhelming, but just picking up a book that's different and talking about it and challenging yourself and having a discussion with someone, that is really good for the brain too. I will tell you, if you are doing crosswords, thinking it's going to help your memory, that we don't see is true. You get really good at crosswords. <laughs> Maybe you're improving your language part of your brain, but it doesn't translate to just other parts of the brain. You really have to challenge that part of the brain. So there are some programs out there that look at memory in particular, and so maybe they can be helpful. We, we still haven't proven that, but that's certainly a part of the research. And our center is a part of that too, looking to see what kinds of computer programs can really improve the brain's functioning. You're also doing the other one, which is socialization, being a part of a community. Time and time again has been shown to be a buffer against cognitive change. People who feel supported, people who feel like they can call upon a neighbor or a friend, do better over seven to 10 years. We see this. They do better on testing, they do better on scores of well-being, and so that's a really important thing. I don't think any of you have a problem. You're all here having a good time. And the last one that I like to talk, well, I'll, I'll second to last one, is stress. Stress can be normal, it was built into us evolutionarily. We saw a lion. We're supposed to feel stress so we can run. We have a cold. Our body feels stress so it can fight it. But stressing about the future, stressing about politics, stressing about what your kids are doing, that is, that's not how our body was built. That chronic stress releases a hormone called cortisol. And that has damage to our blood vessels, to our brain, to our blood sugar. And so we all have to deal with stress. And I see patients who are 65 and older in my geriatric clinic, and everyone comes in and says, I'm retired, I don't have any stress. And that's just not true, everyone has stress. In fact, I see more stress in my retired patients than my colleagues do in their patients who are 20 and 30. And so we have to find ways of handling our stress, but the first thing is just admitting, I feel stressed, and then figuring out activities that we can do to relieve that stress, which could be a walk, which could be going out and seeing nature. There's lots of different things you can do, but doing it every day to help reduce your level of stress. And then the last thing I'll say before I take questions, making sure that if you have hearing issues, you get checked. You get hearing aids if you need it. If you have vision issues or cataracts, addressing those. Those are all sensory inputs to our brain. And when we deny our brain adequate input, we know that the brain changes. We don't yet know why or what the specific reason is. Many people think it's disuse. If you don't use it, you lose it. But we know that hearing and vision in particular are linked to future cognitive change. Is that 20 minutes or can I keep going? I mean, I could go for hours, so it just depends. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I'm happy to take questions. Okay. I'll ask you to speak very, is this okay? Uh, hold the microphone very close to your mouth so that we can hear you. Question. So, my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. parent has Alzheimer's disease that was diagnosed in a clinical room, like in an exam and an MRI scan, and should a person then, the child, get an amyloid test? Can I ask, I'll even add to that question, should a person sign up for 23andMe and get the genetic test that can show risk too? And my answer to that is no in both cases. Um, first of all, I'm not sure I trust the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease because it really is difficult to do. And people who feel like they can do it in just talking to someone, I don't, I don't believe it. It takes a lot in order to truly know. 
I believe we can diagnose dementia, which is those collection of symptoms. And I think we can have a good clinical suspicion for Alzheimer's. But it's much more complicated than that, and we truly need these, these tests looking at those proteins to know for sure. Now, granted, 50 to 80% of cases are Alzheimer's, but there's always other things mixed in, too. And so when you have a family history, I think of it as you have a family history of dementia. Alzheimer's is possible, but I don't know. Each generation has done things differently. Older generations smoked a whole lot, and so there's a lot of chemical exposures, and so vascular changes are likely, too. So I don't know for sure, but what I do know is that uh, this, the APOE test, APOE is a gene that can be passed on from parents, and it increases risk, but it doesn't mean you're going to get it. And I don't have a treatment yet just for people who have this APOE risk factor. So getting it may really just create distress and anxiety. Also, long-term care insurance and disability insurance can look for that information and deny you coverage based on that. So it's sort of something I like to say, no, you know, that we have to protect ourselves because you still can be discriminated in that regard. You can't be in healthcare. There's the GINA Accord, which protects people. The amyloid test, I think, is most important right now for people who already have a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or dementia. If this drug becomes approved for prevention purposes, then certainly I think having a family history puts you in this group that you, should, you could get screened and be put on the drug. But I don't think right now it's, it's something that a person needs to do. Now, if you're in research, you certainly can learn your amyloid status, and that's actually what I do at our center is I talk to participants about their results and what does this mean in the context of their, their history and their experience. But it's very complicated. Most people don't regret doing it, but they're very informed before they decide to learn it. And, and so it's really depending on the individual. But I would say just because a family member, a parent had dementia, does not mean you need to get this test right now. I certainly think if drug therapies become available and you're worried, am I developing symptoms, then yes. Then I think at that point, which is years from now, that would be relevant. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, people online. Sorry about that. Um, I have a sister who's 52, and she was just clinically diagnosed based on one a PET scan two years ago, and recent events, um, inability to move quickly, jerky movements. This is a woman who is University of California, Berkeley, honors. Um, amazing. She didn't sleep. I always told her, sleep, 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 get good sleep, don't burn the candle at both ends. Stress, huge stressor. Um, she's not well. She went missing last night for an hour and a half. Um, she worked at, we both worked at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. It is a super fun site. They found high elevated levels of benzene. So all of these things, first of all, I pushed the neurologist in Pasadena next PET scan. I think it's really important. We have a baseline. I'm a scientist, I would like to see what's next, where are we, how bad, because since I visited in June and I just spent two months there helping, working and then working and giving her a shower and whatnot and then working all night, not sleeping enough, um, really shocked at the decline within, since June. And certainly since last year, it's a thousand percent. Um, so questions about what do we do now? I mean, there's UCLA, obviously. Um, Mayo Clinic, maybe. Um, curious about the benzene levels. What about our food supply? Insecticides have been used much, much more since, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, alcohol, obviously. Red wine's great. Well, if you have more than one, or women shouldn't have more than one, two is fine for men, blah, 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 right? And aerobic, you should always target this. The, the 1980s did more harm than good, telling people to exercise to a certain level instead of just get out and go for a walk. And they finally admitted that, right? So what do we as a family, we're lucky, there's six of us. I'm lucky that I can work remotely, I can go and I can help. Um, she may have 10 years, maybe. What would you do if this was your loved one? What are our next steps? What do we ask? What tests should we be having? Obviously a PET scan, but what do we do? 
Yeah. And I'm going to have to take notes. So I'm going to hand you <laughs> <laughs> Well, and so you're asking these fundamental questions of what does a family do when someone is diagnosed with dementia? It's, and this is early onset. So yes. the definition of early onset is a diagnosis before the age of 65. Early onset cases are very difficult. They're, they are often more pure disease than they are mixed disease. And, and they do progress and manifest symptoms-wise differently. Yeah. But I, the, the first thing is, what are we dealing with? And so that's where I appreciate, you know, there's many different PET scans. So I use the term more generally, but a PET scan really identifies a protein or a process in the brain. But there's many different ones. So amyloid PET scan identifies amyloid. Tau PET scan identifies tau. That's what we're doing in research. But the one that I'm anticipating that happened in clinic is called the glucose PET scan, where you inject the body with glucose. It goes to the brain. The brain cells chew it up. And then by being, it's their primary food. So imagine giving candy to a child. They're just loving it. They're very active. And then it lights up on the scan. So when it doesn't light up, it means the brain cells are either sick or dying. And that can help figure out if you're looking at someone who has Alzheimer's disease or a different condition, like I mentioned, called frontal temporal disease, or even a condition called Lewy body disease, which is like Parkinson. So the first thing for me as a family member is, well, what are we dealing with? What is actually happening in the brain? And even though you couldn't tell me with 100% certainty, I need to know what we think the most likely cause is. So getting another scan or going to a different clinic that offers different scans, that would be the first thing. But while you're doing that, families need to support their loved one, right? And so that would be the tough conversation is, are we going to be at home with home support or are we going to be in a care facility? where there is hired people. And these are really hard conversations, but they have to happen. You also want to know, what do you want? You may not get everything you want, but what do you want? What does your life look like over the next X years? What does your death look like? Because we try to honor the, the, and respect our loved one. We may not be able to achieve everything, but that's called advanced care planning. And so that's talking about those hard, hard to discuss topics that every family has to go through. Legally, you want to know that there is a, a, a health care decision maker, that there is a legal decision maker, and that all the paperwork is done. Because nobody wants to go to probate, nobody wants to deal with the consequences of not having that paperwork. This applies to all of us, right? So we all want to have these things in, just in case. But that certainly is relevant there. And that, I mean, that stresses the importance of, of advanced care planning. But I would also say then it's talking to family about who's going to do what, whose role is going to be what, especially when you have big families, knowing, knowing that. Because when we, when we live in vagueness, when the things get dropped, or people decide not to do things, and there's just not that support, so just being very clear about what, what we're going to do. And the last thing I would say is this idea of hired support so, you know, eventually people will stop driving, but there are driving services. Eventually people stop cooking, but there are food services. There are cleaning services. There are, there are services that can be done. It's hard right now because there's a shortage of labor. Okay, well, yeah. So depending where you are, but I would make sure that, that I call it the team, make sure that team is there, which includes a primary care provider and a memory specialist. And from there, you then start, you're prepared, you have a roadmap, and you have to pivot. But that is one way of making sure that a person goes through this process the best way without crisis moments. Ultimately, you want to avoid crisis. So benzene. Oh, yes, environmental exposures. Yes. You, Yeah. Every day on site. It's only starting to be looked at. So there's not a lot that we know about environmental exposures. People have looked at aluminum and lead and their impact on thinking, and it's always been mixed. It's a hard thing to prove, causation, that you have this and therefore now you have dementia. We certainly think that that increases risk because it's toxic to the brain, but it's really hard to prove. And there's so many different environmental exposures. I'm not sure up here if it's as big of an issue, but PFAS is a huge yes. thing. Okay. 
And, and I went and got a PFAS filter in my house because I just didn't want to deal with this. But, but it wouldn't be something that you have one year of PFAS and you're going to develop dementia, right? This is like 30, 40 years of accumulating toxins. The scary thing is now if you're pregnant and it's passed into your, in utero to your child or generational, is this accumulating? We don't know these things. But that's what there are certainly studies being conducted looking at certain toxins and its impact on these markers, this amyloid and this tau. It's a tough science to do. So ultimately people will say, well, just try to avoid as many pollutants as you can. Air pollution is a big one. So inner cities are looking at air pollution, showing true relationships between particles and cognitive impairment. But again, you know, it's, it's tough to know that one's causing the other. You know, it's, and it's usually, and that's. <laughs> All right, we are going to move on to the next question. <laughs> Hello, I know a young woman who's 36 years old who has frontotemporal dementia. And um, she was uh, diagnosed about uh, two years ago at Mayo Clinic. Um, had a PET scan and MRIs and, and, um, it's uh, pretty sure that that's what she has. Um, reading, I read that um, um, typically patients will live six to ten years after their first symptoms. But um, she is a young woman who is physically very healthy. Uh, is her life expectancy greater than, because uh, usually it, it hits people who are 65, or at least, you know, I've read 45 is the youngest that you usually see this, this disease. And, um, and what are the chances that um, uh, she can pass this on to her children? Uh, there's no family history. Um, she has not had a genetic test done, so we don't know if she has a genetic mutation. Um, but. I think I read that 40% of frontal temporal dementia is genetic. Is that, is that your understanding? There are, there are genes to it, but again, having one gene doesn't mean you're always going to get it. So that's the complexity of genes, is that you can have a gene, but it's not active, or, it, or you can have other genes that make one gene not active. And so it's much more complex than A means this is going to happen. But you're talking about prognosis. and. Being young, yeah, you would think that physically the heart's strong, the muscles are strong, and so a person's going to live longer. But it can be very complicated. Those average of six to eight years, six to ten years is what we say for Alzheimer's disease as well. But people are getting diagnosed earlier, and so maybe that number is changing as too. But it's hard to know because the brain controls everything. It controls the heart, it controls our muscles, it controls everything. And if the brain starts to deteriorate, even at 36, so too will the heart, so too will the lungs at some point. And so it's, I wouldn't be able to say with confidence she's going to live longer because she's younger. And certainly 37, 38 is very young. We, you can see frontal temporal all the way into your 70s. We usually think of it in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So it's definitely very young. But I don't know if, for sure that a person would actually have a longer time with it. And I would also say we're really bad at progno providing prognoses on this because it is still unique to the individual, and it's still unique to those other genes that we still haven't fully understood. So it's, it's very hard to know. I know it's not the answer you're looking for, but it's, it's a very sad case. Does the uh, actual production of the amyloid in a tau have a genetic basis, or is it just affected by the sleep and the diet and the exercise and the stress and the other factors? That is an excellent question. That's a very scientific question. We think of the traditional Alzheimer's disease as the inability to clear amyloid. Tau's already in the cell, so we can't really clear it anyways, but we think of amyloid as it can't be cleared. Early onset Alzheimer's disease, where you're in your 40s, 50s, and 60s, we think of that as an overproduction of amyloid, so it's actually a different pathway. 
and that's linked to genes. So someone, if you ever watch the PBS special on the Colombian population that develops Alzheimer's in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, that is genetic. You pass that on to your kids, your kids are definitely going to get it, and we think that's related to overproducing it. More often for what we talk about here, it's just the inability to clear it and break it down. And so that isn't a particular gene, although there might be genes that actually help with, with breaking it down that aren't active. And so, we, but we know they're not as powerful as the one I mentioned before, that APOE. And so it's probably a mixture. It's not overproduction, but probably a bunch of things coming together where you're not clearing it. Certainly sleep, certainly stress, and actually physical activity. People who have shown great physical activity throughout their lives tend to have bigger brains and lower amounts of amyloid. I can't tell you that one is causing the other, but when we look at the population, that's what we see. So certainly there's a connection between being physically active and having less amyloid in the brain. We're just trying to figure out what the cause is for that. Thank you so much for coming to see us tonight. Um, I ran into a guy 20 years ago that was on kind of doing uh, Alzheimer's research at Harvard. I asked him the one question at the end of the discussion, is there a lock on this stuff? Is there anything that's indicative? And, and the one thing that he said is don't have a brain injury. Don't have a TBI. Mm -hmm. Do not have you know, a, a, a concussion, that kind of stuff. Is that still uh, an accepted standard? Well, I would say we want, always want to protect our brain. And so you wouldn't want a concussion for various reasons. But actually, we're not seeing that one traumatic brain injury or one concussion increases your risk that much in developing Alzheimer's disease or even just dementia. We're seeing multiple repeated head injuries leading, having a, a more important impact in future impairment. Now, I never really want to go against a Harvard doc, but in this regard, <laughs> I'm going to say I don't think that that's really the model now. PhD. Okay, okay. Well, listen, I work with a lot of PhDs. This is recorded, so I'm also not going to go against them either. So, I have a rather short question. In the beginning of your uh, talk, you talked about uh, the two abnormal proteins, and you've been discussing amyloid. But what is the other protein, and how do you spell it? Oh, yes. Um, very good observation. So we know more about amyloid, so more time has been spent in the field. Tau, T-A-U. Tau protein, um, it's a normal protein inside of a brain cell that helps move things within a brain cell. But the amyloid does something to induce changes in tau, and then it clumps. And that clumping inside of a brain cell, sort of like a traffic jam in your brain cell, and it's no longer able to communicate and eventually gets sick and dies. So tau is actually more important, or it's closer in relationship to actually having symptoms. So again, you can have amyloid in your brain for 30 years before you develop symptoms. You can have tau in your brain for five to 10 years before you start having symptoms. So it's closer to what we really care about, which is our, our experience, our, whether or not we have symptoms. There are drugs now being, are being trialed to remove tau as well. In the end, when it comes to just Alzheimer's disease, it will most likely be like HIV, where it's three different things in a cocktail that are given to people to address amyloid, to address tau, to address inflammation probably, or insulin resistance. All of these things can work together, and so likely it's gonna be this multimodal therapy. But we have to do one at a time, unfortunately, first. But tau is actually being done. Yeah. It seems like there's a lot of different factors that are hard to understand. So it makes me wonder if artificial intelligence has any prospects or opportunity to help move the understanding of Alzheimer's forward. Yes. Artificial intelligence is certainly being used right now when it comes to understanding symptoms and predictive value of symptoms. So there are certain centers that are using artificial intelligence to look at medical records across you know, 100,000 people and sort well, how, what's the earliest change that we can, we can identify? And then of that change, how does that relate to the, the end result of these proteins or dementia? So that is certainly being used. Artificial, artificial intelligence is being used in analyzing these scans, particularly blood vessels. So I spent a lot of time talking about amyloid and tau, but we don't have the best markers to truly identify 
decrease blood flow in the brain. You'd think we would, and we have MRI scans, but they're really insensitive to what we need. And fortunately in Wisconsin, we've actually developed a technique that you can actually identify blood flow in four dimensions. And don't ask me how, that's not my field, but it's because of that and artificial intelligence that we're able, we will eventually be able to say, well, yeah, the MRI looks normal, but we're having decreased blood flow in this very small part of the memory center of the brain, and that's likely a contributing factor. So we're getting there, and it has, artificial intelligence will, will sh shrink the time in analyzing that and identifying that. Um, but ultimately, we still need to have these, these, what they're called biomarkers, these tests that can identify biological changes in the brain. question. When you talked about the importance of sleep, uh, what about interrupted sleep, where you're interrupted twice in the in an evening, but can go back to sleep right away? Um, what is the um, effects of interrupted sleep? Are, are, is it? No, it's a great question. What is the effect of interrupted sleep? It's not good. Uh -huh. It's not, but I mean, it, you know, it's, so on one side, I have a colleague who's a geriatric sleep specialist who says, you know what, uh, as a person gets older, zero to two times of interruption at night is considered normal. People go to the bathroom, bladders change, bladder um, urgency changes, and so that's normal. But they're looking at it from just a physiological perspective of that is normal. If you look at it from the brain perspective, every time you wake up, whether it's because you go to the bathroom or because of pain or because your dog just jumped on you, you are, you're, you're leaving that deep stage and you're having to start over, right? Because you don't just wake up and then fall back asleep and go right into deep sleep. It doesn't work that way. And so you really are cutting yourself short, which is why you know, we have to figure out ways to try to get as much sleep as possible. I mean, I would say to you, just based on, now this is just based on what I read, if you could get four solid hours right away in the beginning, that would be the most important because you're hitting your deep sleep stage three right in the beginning. So if you told me, oh, I sleep great from nine until one, and then I wake up, and then I'm up for about 30 minutes, and I go back to sleep, but then I sleep for another three or four hours, okay. I mean, I would take that because I know that from nine to one, you got really good sleep. Conversely, if you said, oh, I'm up every 30 minutes between nine and one, and then I sleep great until 8 a.m., I'm a little bit more concerned because the deep sleep is what matters the most. And if you don't dream or you don't remember your dreams, that's fine, that's a different stage. And, and dreaming actually has a really important part of cementing our memories and helping us emotionally respond to what's happened to us that day or the day before, but it's different than short-term memory, which is what's impacted in that deep sleep. Um, hi, uh, thank you for being yeah. here. And um, I have a, or had a father with um, Alzheimer's, which was confirmed with an autopsy. Um, and, and since he died, um, have dealt with several elderly parents or in-laws that have had some form of dementia. It, 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 I can see the difference because uh, having dealt with a confirmed Alzheimer's patient, I can see that there seems to be a difference to just dementia. Are there any specific things that, that um, you see that separate Alzheimer's itself from dementia, and does that really matter? Wow, that's a very philosophical question there. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I love that you said confirmed. You sound like one of my fellows at, at the memory clinic. <laughs> is it confirmed or not, or is this just a report? Um, does it really matter? You know, I would say the most important thing is this diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or dementia. I think that matters the most. That is the experience that a person is living. And we want to honor that experience and we want to help that experience. And so I think that matters the most. Right now, I don't have drugs that are unique to Lewy body disease or Alzheimer's disease or vascular disease. In fact, I use the same drug for all of those conditions. So from a treatment perspective, 
no, it doesn't matter to that regard. I can predict what things are going to look like years from now if I think it's Alzheimer's versus vascular versus Lewy body. So I can provide more education to families in a certain way so I can tailor it that way. And so in that regard, it matters somewhat. It's always the children of my patients will say, well, should I get tested or what should I be doing? And so there's a difference when you have a parent with Alzheimer's where there could be some, some genetic risk versus something like Lewy body disease where we don't see nearly that much. So in that regards, it matters a little bit. So I think it depends on the family. And I certainly have some families that it just, I tell them it's dementia, I think it's Alzheimer's and that's enough. Whereas I have other families that say, nope, do every test you can, narrow it down. And I think it just depends on what you're going to do with that information. Certainly when, when these drugs become available, they're only available for Alzheimer's. And so that's the difference. So when I talked about these clinical trials, if you have vascular disease or Lewy body disease, that's, these drugs are not going to help because they just address the amyloid protein of Alzheimer's. And so then it matters a great deal because if you don't have amyloid, well, you don't have Alzheimer's and I can't use this drug, then it's probably something else, and unfortunately, I don't have a drug for that that's specific. We will work on that. The field is gaining in that area, but that matters a great deal. It's a, no, it's a great question. We have a question from one of our online viewers. Oh. What is the name of the drug you mentioned that may be available in 2023, uh, the one that helps 27%? Oh, it's called lecanemab, L E C. A-N-E-M-A-B. I feel like I'm in a spelling bee. <laughs> Lecanemab. Um, and that is, that is the drug that we are using in Wisconsin for prevention studies. And that is the one that was used in people with mild cognitive impairment and mild stage dementia that showed that benefit. Um, and we anticipate... Res so everyone will hear about it. If, it. if everything is true, like we think, come December... No, it'll probably be December 1st. It'll make national news that this was the first ever scientifically accepted drug that showed effectiveness. And so it's called lecanemab. All of these drugs are so silly. When it, when it ends with MAB, M-A-B, that stands for monoclonal antibody, meaning we created it, but we based it off of other people donating blood, and it's an antibody, like when you fight an infection, an antibody, but it's targeting the protein of amyloid in the brain. And so that's how it's created. There's other drugs, too, that are being studied. Um, this one just happens to be the first to be released in, in December. What percentage of people that you scan have, have amyloid or tau? Oh, wow. Okay. So what percentage of people that we scan have amyloid and tau? What percentage of people that we scan have amyloid and tau? or tau. Uh, well, first of all, if you don't have amyloid, 98% of the time you don't have tau. Amyloid is causing the tau, the tau change. Um, and so we're only scanning people in research, so we're not scanning people in clinic. And what we're finding is that roughly 30 to 40% of people have elevated amyloid. We also know that if people that 30% of people late in life will have amyloid and it doesn't mean anything, that they're, they're still not having symptoms. So this is what I mean by uncertainty. We're not yet to the point of precision where I can say, you have X and Y, therefore Z is going to happen. We're working on that. That's like a risk score. Um, but no, we, right now, 30 to 40% of people who come through our center will have amyloid. The, we, are, we have participants who are 55 to 90. We have another online question here. Are there animal models for studying Alzheimer's, and do they share the biology of the brain as well as behavior traits as humans? God, these are great questions. Uh, yes, there are mouse models. We call those Mouseheimers. <laughs> and... I would say mouse models are helpful in mechanisms, but they don't inherently have or get Alzheimer's. We actually have to create it by modifying their genes. So it's a helpful way for us. But you're already biasing the study because you're assuming that this gene is causing everything. But it helps us figure out some of these processes. 
Um, we've cured Alzheimer's in mice a hundredfold. I mean, it, it is pr actually quite simple for them. I say for them because I don't do it, but um, it just doesn't relate. It doesn't translate to human beings. And so whenever I read a paper, for instance, and I know that the study was based in mice, I stop reading it. I just, it just is too hard to go from mice to people. And it can, while it can help with mechanisms, it doesn't help people yet. And so unfortunately, we have to study it in people. And, but we still are doing it. There's plenty of people. One of our great researchers at Madison, Dr. Um, Luigi Puglielli, he probably, if he's watching, I'm sorry. He studies it in, in mice, but he's studying a different protein, the protein actually that we're thinking could help break down amyloid. So he has a different reason for it, but um, no treatment for mice is, is effective in people. I just want to know if you need volunteers for your research in medicine. <laughs> <laughs> we do, we do. We always need volunteers. We, we always need to understand how the brain ages and the changes that happen. We are trying to improve our access. This idea of the Wisconsin idea, we don't want people to have to drive five hours to Madison to do this. If we can do things virtually, if we can collect blood remotely and have it shipped, we want to do that. We want to be able to reach more, more rural parts of Wisconsin since we do so much urban. Um, so yes, we... You, the, our, you go on online to our website, um, and we have phone numbers there, and you, you call. And we do a screening process. So it's adrc.wisc.edu. So adrc.wisc.edu. And, and that's where our research thing comes up. If you're interested in my podcast, I have a podcast called Dementia Matters, which is 20 minutes, 20 minute episodes where I interview people uh, on these topics, experts, people who know much more than me, um, and that, and then you can learn more just based on that too. Yeah, I also get credit for those downloads, so you know if you if you do it, I appreciate it. Can you talk a little bit about the evaluation process of drugs and how much of an improvement you have to see in order to uh, approve it? Yes. So you have to go through phases or stages of drug trials, and the first one is just meant to see uh, if there's side effects in people. The second one is meant to see side effects and slight effectiveness in the drug. And the stage three is the big one, where you have thousands of people and you're doing the drug study to show that it can actually prove effectiveness. Now, this is, this is the nuance of the issue, which is that so much of what we talk about is based on questionnaires. So you come in for a clinical trial, it's a long day. And it's you as well as your study partner that are filling out, why well, notice this symptom and this is how it is compared to the last visit. And these are all standard validated questionnaires that can take hours. And it's based on those that that number 27% comes from. It's a questionnaire. So scientists are pretty excited about it. Clinicians are more, are more skeptical because they're asking the question, what does 27% reduced decline look like? What does that mean in real terms to you and I? And that is what they're going to have to answer at this conference that's coming up, as well as afterwards. And that's what the debate in the field is. Just tell me what is clinically meaningful. Because every person has a different definition. And so, but as a field, and certainly as a federal governing body that would approve it, we have to have some sort of standardization of this is what is clinically meaningful, therefore we can do it and pay for it. And these are not cheap medications. So aducanumab initially came out at $56,000 a year, which sounds like a lot, I know. <laughs> but I will tell you, in the, in the space of oncology, and Lord save me if there's an oncologist on this, <laughs> they spend lots of money, and, and they, don't have this, they don't have this, you know, very rigorous, or I would say validated prolongation of life. So it's not that, you know, I argue as a geriatrician if you tell me that a drug is too expensive, I believe that's ageist. You're telling me that my population of 65 and older is not worthy of $56,000 a year, which I don't think is true, because we're willing to spend this much money or more in someone with a terminal condition that prolongs life by six months. And I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying let's apply these principles evenly across our population. So I'm not as concerned about the money. I think economists are. I get that. But... When it, I'm, just, I'm just a physician, so I care about the person in front of me and not necessarily the whole population. I have another online question. 
what impact is Alzheimer's having on Medicare, and is it consuming a significant portion of the system? That is a great, great question. Uh, it has a significant impact on Medicare. Uh, there, in the state of Wisconsin, so fortunately I've prepared one of these questions. So there's 200,000 unpaid family caregivers in the state of Wisconsin, 200,000. That is 206 million hours of unpaid care. So if Medicare had to cover that, we would be bankrupt. So Medicare is healthcare is relying on families to take care of people living with cognitive change. Even as it is, having dementia is a really expensive condition because of the frequent hospitalizations, the nursing facility care. And so if we do not do anything about it, by 2050, I think they said there's going to be 15 million people living in this no, is that, yeah, 15 million people living in the U.S. with dementia, that will bankrupt Medicare. I mean, we just cannot afford that. Now, fortunately, I don't think we're going to get to that because we are doing much better than, than before. But it is a serious issue that affects Medicare, and we need to provide social services for people living with dementia and the families that are taking care of them. And so that, that, that is why the NIH, regardless of who's sitting in the Oval Office, continues to fund... Alzheimer's disease work because they know that this is a real this is a priority. In Wisconsin, Alzheimer's disease and cancer are the two priorities of clinical research. That they've already said that, that these are the two things we must address. And so they're putting money to the to what we think is a priority. Yeah, let's not end on money. Let's talk about something else. <laughs> Um, I, I saw a research paper kind of late summer that was talk, looking at um, a virus activating another latent virus and um, thinking that it has at least causes some Alzheimer's. Um, one of it, they also mentioned that um, getting a shingles vaccine actually seemed to reduce the incidence of getting Alzheimer's. So anyway, I was just wondering about... Uh, if viruses are, uh, uh, could be causing Alzheimer's, I guess. That's a great question. Uh, so can viruses cause Alzheimer's? Well, first I would say there are many studies that show the shingle shot, the flu shot, the, pneumo the pneumonia shot are all linked to reduced risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Can't tell you exactly why that is, but vaccination is believed to be one of the mechanisms that has led to reductions. In, in cognitive disease or cognitive impairment. So herpes virus, the kind of just very common herpes virus that we have on our mouths, has been linked to, to changes in the brain. And they are latent, meaning they infect us, so you get the initial infection, but then they go into your nerve cells and they stay there, which means no therapy is going to kill them because they're just living in your, your... It's like an Airbnb guest that won't go away. <laughs> and so they're living there, and then it gets reactivated. And that reactivation can cause inflammation and sort of just um, irritation in the brain. And so in that regard, some people are, are believing that this amyloid protein, which I've been saying in a very negative way, got to get rid of amyloid, amyloid is bad. Some people are saying, well, amyloid might actually be our brain's way of fighting viruses that are being reactivated in the brain, fighting inflammation. And so maybe just too much of it is not a good thing, but that amyloid might actually be our body's way of putting that virus down. So there, and that COVID and long COVID and brain fog have certainly brought this back into the field, knowing that these, these viruses, it's not really bacteria as much, but viruses are very unique um, infections. And so they may be triggering processes in the brain that eventually lead to amyloid and tau. And so yes, there's much, much debate and there's actually much research now um, as a result of COVID. Last question. So this is two, actually. Um, related to vascular issues, I had severe preeclampsia. My daughter was born 10 to 12 weeks prematurely. COVID. So both of those are vascular damagers. What should I look out for for my, myself? Like my sister and I are actually only half sis uh, She's my niece, actually. So the genetic thing is a little interesting. For myself, I'm looking at vascular. I walk every day. I used to lift weight. I used to be in incredible condition. 
healthy, whatever, you know, challenging my mind. What do I do? Because I, you know, doctors have said, well, this severe preeclampsia that nearly killed you is going to be bad. It will have lasting effects on your body. And now long haul COVID, which we're still, I honestly think we have no clue how bad this is going to be. So what, what would someone like myself look out for? I mean, given my, my, actually my niece's situation, what do I look for for myself? Yeah, so I, one of the things I would say is there's a way of looking at disease and then there's a way of looking at health. And so we, you can't control that you have these certain risk factors for, for vascular change, but you certainly can control what you do with your everyday. And so in this regard, it's all these vascular risk factors. So that's high blood pressure or just blood pressure in general. So it's not just about disease, it's about optimizing your health. So optimal blood pressure, optimal blood sugar, optimal cholesterol levels, optimal levels of activity, protecting your brain through not smoking, not drinking. I know it sounds boring, but it's a good thing for you. And then um, sleeping well, because sleep is greatly linked to our vascular health. Um, and then making sure if you do need a medication, you're taking one that is appropriate and doing its job. And so um, no one asked the question of statins and brains and dementia, but statins have for a long time been thought to cause dementia. They don't cause dementia. Um, depending on if you're, you have a high vascular risk factor, they can actually reduce the risk of dementia. That doesn't mean you can't have side effects, which is a separate issue. But So being on the appropriate medical therapies for your chronic health conditions is what, is what you have to do. And, and that, that's the best you can do, um, just because you can't control everything, but you do what you can. And I would say, um, I, you know, I gave you guys a bunch of different lifestyle factors. I would pick one and start with one and feel good about that one before moving on to the next one. Maybe you're already really good at being physically active, so then pick something different. I wouldn't pick something that's really hard. I wouldn't pick something like diet first. I just, it, it, it can be very frustrating. But if sleep is your thing, then pick sleep. If stress reduction is yours, then pick that. But you have to be, you have to just do it on a daily basis to create the habit and be kind to yourself because no one is perfect. No one, I already told you, I just drank Dr. Pepper on the way up here, right? And I'm giving you a talk about how bad soda is. So <laughs> no one is perfect, but you just have to be able to, to be, feel good about what you do during the day. Hopefully it brings you well-being, but certainly doing these things will help keep your brain sharp. Thank you, yeah. Thank you to Nathan Shin. <laughs> thank you to everybody tonight who participated, and thank you to our sponsors, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the UW Alumni Association, Monaco Public Library, UW Kemp Natural Resources Station, UW Trout Lake Station, WXPR Radio, and the Brittingham Foundation. Stay tuned for the timing of our next event on whether it gets changed to Thursday or Wednesday. So that'll be at the beginning of December for the usual time-ish frame. And we'll see you back at Oak Fire for that one. And if you'd like to sign up for email reminders for our events, we have a sign up in the back. Um, or you can contact us on scienceontapmonaqua.org. Thank you. <laughs>